Good morning, one and all. And welcome to those who are streaming online as well. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's take a few moments to still our hearts before the Lord as we prepare to come before Him in His presence. Let us acknowledge His hand in our lives and acknowledge His presence with us here today. And Lord, we thank you for seeing us through, for your faithfulness to us this past week. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Church, shall we stand together as I read these words of preparation? We have all come together as a family of God in our Father's presence to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive his holy word, to bring before him the needs of the world, to ask his forgiveness of our sins, and to seek his grace that through his Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. Scripture says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins to Almighty God. You may now sit or kneel as a posture of confession. Let's take a few moments to allow the Lord to search our hearts. Let us bring our sins before the Lord. Let us pray together this prayer of confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Let us receive God's forgiveness. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon, deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Church, shall we rise? Let's give God the glorious praise he deserves. Let's praise him. Let's put our hands together. From the highest throne to the earth below, you lay down your life for the likes of us. Great is the love of the Savior. From a wounded heart to a life made whole, every human heart will declare as one. Great is the love of the Savior. Lord of endless life. Lord of endless life. Let your glory shine forever. All the earth, all the earth will sing your praise. Your name be lifted higher. 
my God. We praise you, God. Thank you, God. you 
loved by you, Lord. Your love, unconditional, undeniable love. Precious Jesus. Lord, we love you, Lord. And we exalt you. Be exalted, Lord. Be exalted, Lord.
you are our hope, Lord. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Church, let's pray to collect together. And together, Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life of all who put their trust in Him, raise us, we pray, from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, that we may seek the things which are above, where He reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let us remain in a posture of prayer as we intercede for the church, the world, and for those in need. Thank you, Lord, that in you there is hope for all things. Father, we pray this morning, first of all, for the Diocese of Singapore, for the Church of the, of the Epiphany. We ask, Lord, that you may continue to anoint the acting vicar, Reverend Edison Wilson, to shepherd this church with integrity of heart. We thank you, we praise you for establishing this church that serves the Tamil speaking, as well as the English and Mandarin speaking. And we pray, Lord, for a flourishing of each language congregation and of the relationships amongst them. We also pray, Lord, that you may see through their redevelopment efforts to build a sanctuary that can house a 500 strong congregation. And we pray that you may bring forth the needed remaining finances and strengthen the building committee. For our church, St. James, Lord, we pray for the upcoming homecoming retreat in June. Lord, we ask that you may anoint Bishop Robert Solomon with a word in season for our church family. We pray, we pray that many will be able to make time for this retreat across the many generations in our church, young and old, to behold you together in worship, and that in so doing, we may be transformed to be more like you. For the world, we pray this morning for Sudan. Lord, we pray that the warring military factions may lay down their arms and concede to peace talks. Lord, we ask for your divine protection for the Sudanese people who have experienced so much devastation, many of whom are lacking the basic needs of food, water and medical care. Lord, we pray for hope for the despairing, comfort for the grieving and a transition of this precious nation to a new era of stability and just government. For country of Singapore, Lord, we pray for your hand over the ongoing parliamentary proceedings. Lord, we ask, Lord, that every parliamentarian and civil servant to serve with utmost integrity to work towards the common good of the nation. We pray also for the development of a strong and capable 4G leadership team in government that can steer, steer our nation well in an increasingly troubled world. Finally, we want to pray for ourselves and for those whom we personally know who are hurting in body, mind or spirit. Let's take a few moments to lift up our needs and the needs of others whom we know to the Lord. experience your love, your peace, your comfort in our time of need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Very good morning to one and all. My name is Pastor Siang Guan and even for those who are joining us online, welcome. I'd like to just recognize if this is the first or second time uh, that you are worshipping with us, could you just maybe raise your hands? Anyone? Oh, yes. Uh, up here and also towards the back. Are there any more that I've missed out meanwhile? Well, uh, just to say that the hosts are going to give to you a little welcome pack. Yeah? Uh, in there, there's a little coupon uh, for you to have a cup of coffee at our cafe later during breakfast, right? Uh, at the first level. Just to say, uh, please make your way to the welcome table as well as the info counter down there. It's marked by two banners and we hope to catch up with you over breakfast there later, all right? 
Now, uh, let me just give us some announcements as you come in. Yeah, I hope that you have uh, gotten your name written on this sticker. Uh, we have our name tag we end like once every two months and it is such a wonderful help for myself and all the pastors too. It's a way for us to get to know this uh, church family. So uh, please greet one another by name and you know, uh, may the Lord bless you as you do so. Okay, uh, can I just say that this coming week, yeah, on the 12th, no, two weeks time, 12th and the 19th of May, we are going to have an uh, engagement whereby we have two persons who are coming to uh, speak to us on some of the issues that, you know, especially our young adults, but not only them. Many of us may be asking, are there things like, can Christians even join in the national conversations on various issues? Should we as a church speak out dialogue in the public square? You know, what about you know, pertinent questions? Because we live in a pluralistic kind of society. Uh, what other kind of things we as Christians would like to consider? What are some of the biblical commands? Because we are asked to seek the welfare of the city that we are uh, living in. Right? So questions like this, you know, come and join us. We have invited uh, Reverend Dr. Jeremy Joe, uh, our Anglican uh, pastor who is also teaching in Trinity Theological College and Reverend uh, Jared William Drownell, uh, who will be addressing some of these things over the two weekends uh, on Friday nights, right? So come, uh, it will start at 8 p.m. and will last by about 9.45 to about 10 at the latest. So to register, just scan the QR code as usual. All right, so hope to have you all there. Second, do let us know next Sunday at the 11.30 uh, a.m. service, we are going to have baptism. Uh, thank God, 26 infants, children and adults will be baptized next Sunday. So uh, if you can, come and support the, uh, those who are getting baptized and being added into the church family here in St. James. All right, so 11.30 a.m. service. Uh, tomorrow is uh, Labor Day, right? And uh, since it falls on a Monday, uh, just to let us know, the church office will be taking our off in lieu on Tuesday, so uh, the office will be closed. But if there's any emergency, please just call the church uh, line, 64690715, right? Uh, one more announcement, and that is missions prayer meeting. Uh, we are having the next... Uh, missions prayer meeting on the 14th of May, uh, two weeks from now. And it will be happening after the 11.30 uh, a.m. service, starting from 1.30 p.m. to about 2.30 p.m. It's just one hour. And I want to encourage us to come if you can, and we will introduce some of these uh, mission-focused uh, items each time. So this coming round, we'll be um, focusing on Myanmar, and, you know, and also some of the short-term mission uh, teams that are going out from uh, St. James in the coming month of June, right? So really the Great Commission is Jesus' last command to us. Yeah. So come uh, and see how you can pray and play your part uh, in completing world evangelization. If there's any questions you may have, you can uh, email to Diana at sjc.org.sg. Yeah, last but not least, I want to uh, call upon uh, the visitors, Nathan and Jeanette, uh, and their little one, uh, Lizzie. Let's welcome them. Yeah. yeah. So glad because they are en route uh, at this moment. They just came off from Okinawa and they've been spending time there en route back to the US because God has redirected them. And, I leave them to just uh, share more and then we can pray for them at the end of it. Yeah, Nathan. Uh, good morning, St. James Church. It's so good to be back home after about three and a half years. And it's so wonderful to be able to worship with all of you this morning. And we're just so happy that we can be here to see each of you face to face. And 
to just say thank you so much for praying and supporting us so faithfully and constantly so that we can serve God in Okinawa. So as Pastor shared, we are en route to America from Okinawa, but uh, I've been a missionary serving in Okinawa for 17 years, and Jeanette has been there for six years. So I'd like to share a little bit about what we've been doing. But over the years, I've done so many things. I just want to take two highlights of what we've been up to recently. And you can see some pictures on the screen up there. One area is cell group. Another area is children's ministry. But let me just say, these past few years, God has given us a focus on building and strengthening the body of Christ. And these are two areas that we've been pouring into. One, cell groups. Many churches in Japan, they don't have a cell group ministry. The churches are still small and growing. And even if they have one, it's uh, maybe they don't have uh, like family groups or it's very small. But we experienced such great blessing of cell groups in St. James Church. It's been such a source of encouragement and strength for us. We wanted to bring this blessing to Japan. So God led us to pioneer a cell group ministry in our church. Uh, we started with one group, but with the hope of raising up leaders through the group. And we're excited that we are leaving, but we, two families from our, our group have picked up the vision and they have become uh, cell group leaders and started groups in their own homes. And the church is uh, catching the vision and it's growing church-wide. So that's a very exciting development. And the church we work with also has a... Uh, strong emphasis on children's ministry. Uh, I've been working in the Sunday school ministry for many years. The church also, they run three preschools and an after-school kids club, and they do this working with the city government. So every week, hundreds of kids come through the church. Uh, most of them are from non-Christian families in the community, but they're hearing the word of God and learning how to pray every day. And it's been exciting to see Several families get connected with the church and they're attending weekly now through these uh, school ministries. So God is doing a lot of exciting things in Okinawa. So we were quite surprised when we felt God saying, make a move to America. God, you're doing such great things here. Why are you moving us to America? But as we prayed into it more and more, we felt God's confirmation to go this way. And he was also showing us that America is a land that has many, many needs now. They need the gospel. They need Christ. They need God's love as well. And he's called us to go share Christ's love in that land as well. So we feel uh, we're not just going back to my hometown. God is shifting us to a mi new mission field. We still carry the heart of missionaries as we go. Yes. And as we went, uh, we're asking God, what are we specifically go going to do there? He gave us three specific words, is to serve family, bless the hometown, and serve the nations. We'll be continuing to bless the nations and serve the nations as we also pour into the local community as well. But we're still in the process of praying what that's going to look like. We're uh, exploring different ways to minister through my local church in America. But we appreciate your prayers in this big transition process. Uh, there'll be a lot of adjustments as actually I've spent my entire adult life in Japan. So in a way, it's going to be culture shock going back to America. Jeanette has never lived in America. She's always lived in uh, Asia. So we will need your help to learn to live in this new land. Our prayer points are a simple ABC to help you remember. Adjustment to the new land and new ways, building a new life in America, and clarifying uh, God's call and work in our lives. So we appreciate your prayers and partnering with us as we share Christ's love in Okinawa, Japan, America, and the world. And we'll be here for about three weeks, so we'd love to connect with anyone if you reach out to us. So God bless, and we'll continue to pray for St. James as well. Thank you. So, so church, let us now uh, commit the viscous to God. Can I invite you to just also stretch out your hands as we pray for them? Father, we just want to thank you for both Nathan, Jeanette, and Lord,
for your blessing of little Elizabeth into their family, Lord. Lord, even as you have directed their path now back to the U.S., Lord, we are confident that your spirit has gone before them. Lord, may you light up the path that they are to take. Lord, each and every step, may they be guided by your word, by your spirit's prompting. And Lord, we pray and bless even Nathan's home church in, in uh, the U.S. Lord, may they be filled with your blessing, even as they, as a church, also discern together with Nathan and Jeanette, Lord, how they can be used of God. Now to return back to the U.S. and Lord, bless this nation that has been such a blessing to many other countries all over the world. Revive, Lord, and also continue to strengthen both families, church, and most importantly, this nation, that your glory will continue to cover not only in the U.S., but also all over the world. For your name's sake, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Let's continue to... As Nathan said, they'll be here just for another two odd weeks. Uh, do connect with them, find out more, so that you can continue to pray with them. Let's now rise, shall we? Let's commit ourselves to God as we worship Him with our tithes and also bring him our free will offering. Lord, we thank you. You are a good, good Father who has given us all things. And Lord, what a joy that we can have in just returning to you this tithe. Lord, the blessings of your hands for our income that we can receive through our work. And Lord, our free will offering of gratefulness and thanksgiving because you have blessed us with so, so much more. In the name of Jesus, we pray. be seated.
Good morning. Today's reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honour, not in the passion of lusts, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever district Sorry. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word gives life. Your word directs our path. In the spirit of the living God, we pray even as we hear... The Lord's word, may you work deeply in our hearts and transform our lives today. Thank you, Father. You are the good, good Father. Indeed, who could imagine so great a mercy? Who could understand such boundless grace? And thank you, Father, even as these few months we look through the seven deadly sins in our life, greed, anger, envy, pride, sloth, gluttony, and today, lust, that, God, you have been merciful to us. So, Father, we pray, God, for your continual sanctification in our heart and soul, that day by day, we learn to walk in newness of life, and we learn to walk in holiness of life, that we learn to walk in your ways. Thank you, Father that even as we hear your word today, we know we rest in your love. We stand secure in your grace that you will always forgive us when we truly repent. The Spirit of God, minister deeply in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yesterday morning, I woke up and check out the Channel News Asia website, which I usually do every day just to catch the news. And this particular headline appeared top of the web page. How did child porn become a global nightmare? And what is Singapore doing to tackle it? Every now and then, we will hear expressions of lust in the human beings in different ways, not only in Singapore, but all around the world. Today, I will touch on the last deadly scene in our sermon series on the issue of lust. And from May onwards, May and June, our vicar has planned a sermon series on the parables. So today, lust, and I've entitled my sermon title, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Passion, Lust. I remember this verse that God spoke to Cain at the beginning of time in Genesis. The Lord said to Cain, just as he was about to kill his brother Abel, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is to destroy you, but you must rule over it. The sin of lust, my dear brothers and sisters, is deadly. It can, it will, and it has destroyed many lives. And only, only by the power of God, only by the grace of God can you and I overcome it. So let us go through what is God's word saying about sex and sexuality and this sin of lust. 
Firstly, we need to understand that human sexuality is God's creation design. It is God's creation gift for all mankind. We read in Genesis 1.27, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. And Genesis 2.27, And the man and his wife here referring to Adam and Eve were both naked and they were not Ashamed before sin came into the world. Marital sex between male and female within marriage is a gift from Creator God for pleasure, for procreation. There is that sanctity of sex within marriage. Human sexuality is a gift from God. All of us created in the image of God are sexual beings, body, beauty, and for enjoyment. There is that oneness within marriage between husband and wife, physical, psychological, spiritual. Human sexuality is beautiful, is good, is what God has planned for the very beginning. That's why when God took a rib from Adam and formed Eve, and when Adam saw Eve, you know what was the first thing Adam said? Whoa, man! Whoa, man, you get it? Okay, woman, please come here. <laughs> Whoa, man, okay, that, that's not the actual thing, huh? I'm just saying. <laughs> Whoa, man, wonderful, because Adam was so excited because finally God created a helper for him. So human sexuality, remember this, is God's creation, design, and gift. Nothing to be ashamed of when we walk in purity. But... But you see, my dear friends, because of sin, God's gift of sexuality has been perverted into sexual immorality. God's gift, because of sin in this world, has been perverted into sexual immorality. The Apostle John wrote, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father. It's not from the Father. It's not from the good, good Father, but it's from the world. In other Bible translations, you will find the word, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, or the gratification of the flesh, or the gratification of the eyes. The word lust is translated from the Greek word epithemia. Epithemia means desire passionate longing or lust. And this is a sexual sin that has perverted God's given gift of sexuality. I share three examples from the Old Testament. The first, you look at this picture. Who does it remind you of in the Bible? He's got long hair, I'll give you a clue. Samson, isn't it? And Samson has a weakness, though he is strong. God gave him strength, but he has a weakness for women. And the Philistines know it, so they got a woman to trick him. And when Samson saw her, she, he, he cried out, Ah, Delilah! <laughs> That's why her name is Delilah, right? Okay, never mind. <laughs> Maybe Samson was Chinese, right? Nilayla! He was excited, but led, led to his fall, right? Because he revealed the secret of his strength, which was his long hair. In the end, they cut his hair, and he lost all his strength. The second example, many of us may be familiar, is King David. King David. King David, in 2 Samuel 11, God it, uh, the Bible describes for us in verse 1, on the days when kings go to war, King David stayed at home. He stayed at home. There was no Netflix to watch, no internet to serve. So he went up to his penthouse of his palace and looked across the land. And in those days in Jerusalem, houses have flat roofs. And there, lo and behold, he saw Bathsheba on the top of her roof and ended up committing adultery with her. Third example, another king, King Solomon, right? 
1 Kings 11.3 tells us King Solomon had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 porcupines. Ah, no, sorry, uh, concubines. <laughs> 700 princesses and queens and 300 concubines. And scripture here says his wives turned his heart away from Jehovah God. Solomon, if he was Cantonese, you all will tell him what, right? Solo, right? Solomon, right? He's really a Solomon. His last led him to such a situation. He had wisdom from God, but in the area of this, he didn't walk with God. So seriously, my friends, sexuality is a gift from God, but because of sin, because of sin, this gift has been perverted into sexual immorality. How then does everything begin? You see, my friends, lust begins in the desires of our heart and mind. Lust begins in the desire of our heart and mind. There was a master and his disciple who was walking along the road and passing by a river. And as they looked into the river, they saw a lady drowning. And without hesitation, the master said, come, let's save her. So they jumped into the river, rescued the drowning lady, and she was saved. And they continued on with their journey after making sure that she was all right. After a while, as they walked, the master noticed that his disciple looked uncomfortable. And then finally, the disciple cannot tahan anymore and said, Master, Master, I thought in our religion we are not supposed to touch a woman. But the master wisely replied to his disciple, Well, this was a situation that needed rescue, otherwise she would die. Therefore, we did what we had to do. Then a master continued to tell his disciple, You know what? I carried her with my hands, and I have put her down and moved on. But you, you dear disciple, you still carry her in your heart and in your mind. My friends, what our heart desires, our will chooses, and our mind justifies. I say again, what our heart desires, our will chooses, and our mind justify. How? How? We will say, well, it is okay, just one time only. Or we may think, hey, no one else knows I'm alone. Or we may say, oh, my wife or my husband cannot satisfy me now sexually. What? Our heart desires? Our will chooses, and our mind justifies. Jesus told his disciples, You have heard what it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Adultery in his heart. Heart, a look with lustful intent. So, my dear friends, lust begins with a desire in our heart, which then feeds our mind, which eventually leads to action. The real better ground is in the mind. It is that spiritual warfare. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the churches, for example, the church to, in Rome, he told them in Romans 12, hey, hey, look out, the renewal of your mind is so important, isn't it? He wrote to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, take captive, take captive every thought in obedience to Christ Jesus. The better ground is the mind. Of course, from the heart to the mind. So the question for us today is, what are we feeding our mind with? What images, what pictures, what photos, what advertisements are we looking at? What are we looking at? Looking at this verse from Jesus in Matthew 5, I would say, my dear friends, the first look, the first look is unavoidable, a casual glance. Otherwise, you and I, when we go 
home after service to the MRT. Pastor said, cannot look, so we will just walk like this. <laughs> you langa into the traffic light of the car, right? You have to look at people, otherwise you langa into them in the MRT train. So the first look is unavoidable at the MRT. You know, my friends, when I was a young clergy at St. Andrew's Cathedral, I remember a senior clergy, once in a while, he will remind the congregation, especially the ladies, to dress modestly. And he explained that at the cathedral, we have kneels. So we kneel, right? We kneel this way. So can you imagine for us when we give out Holy Communion with the people kneeling down? So there are times I realize, ah, I know why my senior clergy said that. Because I realize when I give the wafer, there are times where I have to, the, the, the bread, the... <laughs> You know what I mean? The body of Christ keeps you in eternal life. It's like my favorite player for me, no, right? Scoring his goal. He don't have to look. He just kick and the ball goes in. Football, you can. But how to give the way for the, bread, the body of Christ? I've done it. I remember I had to do it a few times. First look, unavoidable. Second look, unadvisable, which means keep on looking and looking. A constant stare with the purpose of lasting to feed the inner sensual appetite. The third look, the third look and so on, will become uncontrollable, hidden passion that in time to come will lead to actions like fornication, more or less, rape, adultery, sexual perversions, pornography, and so forth. So remember, first look, unavoidable. Second look, unadvisable. That look onwards, it becomes uncontrollable. So we must watch out. Why? Because there are deadly consequences. Last, as well as all the other sins we have looked at, has deadly consequences. James warned God's people. No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and He Himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. That when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin, when it has run its course, brings forth death. So there is temptation, and then when temptation when the person is carried away, enticed by his own lust, and lust being conceived will give birth to sin, and sin running its course will bring forth death. Lust, sin, death. We know in the Roman Empire, in history, in the first century, moral, sexual immorality is, was common, very common, very, very common. You'll find many paintings, something like this. That's why the Apostle Paul gave much warning in his letters to the churches. In New Testament Greek, the word poneia, poneia meaning fornication or sexual immorality. That's where we get the word pornography, sexual immorality in written or picture form. And Paul warned the churches in his letters, indeed, those who are sexually immoral, living that lifestyle of lifestyle, it is a lifestyle of sexual immorality, cannot enter the kingdom of God. Such is the serious judgment of a holy God. The references are there, 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5. Galatians 5, 19, for example, Paul so mentioned, the works of the flesh are evident, Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Some of us may remember when we did Revelation, what Pastor Glenn was teaching us. In Revelation 21, verse 8, it talks about the second death. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable. As for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Spiritual death is more frightening than physical death. You may know of modern examples of people who have suffered deadly consequences 
Perhaps in the last 10 to 20 years, you may have heard of prominent church leaders who have fallen in this particular area of sin. In my years in church ministry all these years, I've had opportunities to pray, to counsel, to help, and to guide those who are struggling in this area of lust. And even for a few, I've got friends, quite a number of friends, and I've got a few friends who had fallen years ago, a friend who uh, did something wrong with his mate, and a few friends I know who had to leave full-time ministry because of this sin and have affected marriages. The consequences of lust is deadly. Its impact is destructive. We may know how it may have ended careers of company leaders and politicians. It affects both new Christians as well as spiritually mature Christians. No difference. It has destroyed ministries of Christian leaders, pastors, missionaries, Christian workers. It has broken up marriages and families, and it has grieved the heart of spouses and children. But you know, the most impactful is spiritual, where lust ultimately results in the loss of intimacy with God. Sexuality and spirituality is interconnected. Lust ultimately results in the loss of intimacy with God. So my dear friends, what then are you and I to do? As we heard from Scripture earlier, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let us learn to walk in holiness of life. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. I've showed us on the screen what John Piper, in his exposition of 1 Thessalonians 4, said about this text. I quote him, Lust is a sexual desire that dishonors the object and disregards God. Sexual desire in itself is good. God made it in the beginning. It has its proper place. But it was made to be governed and regulated or guided by two concerns. One, honor towards the other person. And two, holiness toward God. If your sexual desire is not guided by respect for others and regard for the holiness of God, it is lust. So in this text that Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4, he gave us three reasons, three reasons why we ought in, to walk in holiness of life. Firstly, Firstly, from verse 1, if I can ask of you to turn back to your Bibles in 1 Thessalonians 4. I didn't screen the verses, but if you can look at your Bibles, dear friends. Firstly, verse 1 says, to please God, to please God. Finally, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. To please God. So one question we ask when we are tempted to sin in lust is, how much do we want to please God? If we say we really want to please God, then we know we do not fall into that temptation. Second, to obey God. To obey God, I read from verses 3 to 5. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Second reason, to obey God, to obey the will of God, to abstain from sexual immorality, to control his own body in holiness and honor. Remember what Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, you will obey my commands, to obey God. And thirdly, to fear God. To fear God. 
Verse 7 and 8, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this command, whoever disregards this command, disregards not man, but disregards God who gives His Holy Spirit to you. What does it mean to disregard God? It means to ignore Him, to neglect Him, to disobey Him. Therefore, on the other side of it, it is to consider the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, isn't it? The reverence, respect, love, honor for God. When we fear God, we will know what it means to have purity of heart and mind. We sang earlier, isn't it? Purify my heart. We ask God to purify our heart. He has called us to be holy, and we choose to be holy because we learn to walk in obedience to Christ, to walk in holiness of life. So church, may I encourage us to walk in holiness of life in this area, to please God, to obey God, and to fear God. Finally, how then can we overcome lust? Only by God's grace. Only, only by God's grace. And I offer seven suggestions for us to consider. First, we must deal with it decisively. We must deal with it immediately. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next week. You know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30? If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. So the right eye talks about seeing. And I was thinking, wow, lately in recent weeks, my left eye is giving problem. Now I can't really see the words on the screen. In my right eye also cannot take out. I can't see anymore, isn't it? But of course, it's hyperbolic in that sense, right? And it, it goes on, verse 30, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. Right hand. Touching, seeing, touching, seeing, touching. Hyperbolic, very serious, deadly sin. We need that spiritual surgery of the heart, the mind, our action. In fact, it is so serious that some Bible interpreters have interpreted this text as going to hell, literally, literally will one lose our salvation? It is something seriously to consider. Deal with it. Deal with it decisively, immediately. Second, we thank God for His mercy and grace. Repent. Once we decide to deal with it, learn to repent and be restored. King David, after he committed adultery, Bathsheba repented. After prophet Nathan rebuked him, he repented and he wrote Psalm 51. Psalm 51, a wonderful psalm for us to be reminded that God is the merciful God. He cried out to God, God have mercy. God have mercy on me. He asked God to create in him a clean heart. He asked God to renew a right spirit within him. He asked God to restore to him the joy of God's salvation. He knows, he knows that a broken and contrite heart the Lord will not despise because the Lord will receive the repentant sinner. The Apostle Paul told the church in Colossae, chapter 3, verse 5, Colossians, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire. Repentance, restoration. Important. Thirdly, watch what your eyes see. Don't fit the last in the mind. Advertisements at the bus stop, MRT, okay lah, first glance, huh? remember? First look, unavoidable. After that, don't keep, your bus come already, uh, still looking, okay? No, okay? Stop looking. Don't fit the last in our mind. Movies, we watch, novels, we read, even talk at the office, be careful, because sometimes certain talk out of the office, you know it's not good, not edifying. 
walk away, take your copy, and go back to your, to your table. It's not edifying. Don't dwell on sexual fantasies. Stop serving pornographic websites. With the internet and with computers, it is so easy now. A few clicks, the laptop, the phone, and the iPad. Don't dwell on them. Watch what our eyes see. Number four. Flee! Chawa! Flee! Seriously, flee. That's what happened to Joseph, isn't it, in the Old Testament when Potiphar, his master's wife, gripped onto his clothing. He ran, even lost his cloak along the way. Don't mind. After the kind of evidence uh, against him, <laughs> but he left his cloak behind. Flee! Run away from sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. 2 Timothy 2, 22. Flee from sexual immorality. Flee! Paul told Timothy, his disciple, youthful passions, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Be alert. No one is exempted from this. All need the grace of God for redemption, for rescue. Identify the early beginnings of lustful thoughts, maybe at a particular time of the day, maybe certain triggers that may trigger those thoughts, maybe certain circumstances, maybe certain people, that you meet, identify early beginnings and guard them. There may be seasons of vulnerability when we may be a little bit more vulnerable for to the sin of lust. For the man, for example, when your wife is pregnant, there will be that season when intimacy might be difficult. Be careful during that season. And for many of us, loneliness, pain, depression, Sometimes we do not know how to cope and we ended up doing some things we regret. Know our weaknesses. Don't place ourselves in a place or a position of vulnerability. Flee from sexual immorality. Number five, guard yourself at the workplace and at church ministries. Romances, attractions can happen at the workplace because of working relationships. For some who need to entertain for work in the night, meals over lunch and dinner often with colleagues, drinks, night drinks after work, car rides, all this may lead to romances and attraction. Be careful. Some of us travel in the course of our work, overseas travel for work, be careful, places you visit, people you meet, the hotel you stay. When I took over as the dean of Vietnam some years back, my predecessor reminded me, taught me, John, in Vietnam, when you stay in the hotel room, if, if at night, at 1, 2 a.m., you hear this at your door, don't open your door. And I say, okay, thank you very much. Of course, it's the bishop. I better open for him. <laughs> and I, I got to remember. And I thank God those eight years as dean, thank God his grace that he always provide a travel companion. It could be the bishop. It could be a fellow clergy, a fellow brother in Christ. Very, very rarely I traveled alone. And of course, I had the Vietnam pastors with me. It is just God's way of protecting me. At the workplace also, my friends, be careful about emotional adultery. Emotional, not physical, emotional adultery. Be careful about developing unhealthy friendships. Sometimes when you're down, depressed or pain, a caring woman colleague or a caring man colleague, oh, how are you? I noticed you have been unwell these few weeks. You look down. Can I, uh, you know, buy you coffee after work? Ding, ding. Be careful. Okay, be careful. There was a survey done in the United Kingdom and in Australia where four out of ten, almost half, four out of ten people admitted to flings at the office. So let us be careful. Of course, church ministries is no different. Because we are all fellow human beings, we need to guard against temptations when you and I serve together in church. I know of a sad situation of a missionary 
who committed adultery when out in the mission field, decided to divorce his wife and go with the other woman. He had to leave the mission field. He's got no more credibility to serve God anymore. Number six, seek help. Seek help from someone. Talk to a pastor or a confidant, your cell leader or a trusted brother or sister. Or you may like to read some articles. I have in hand a limited number of copies of this book entitled, When a Man's Eye Wonders. When a Man's Eye Wonders, Breaking the Power of Pornography. I've made it available at the three exits. So anyone you think you may need it to read for yourself, or you may know of someone you think will be helpful to read, you can bring it to him or her. When a man's eye wonders, breaking the power of pornography. For those who may think it has really become an addiction, you really need counseling. Don't ignore the warning signs. Find an accountability partner, a prayer partner, a trustworthy friend who cares about your private inner life. Remember when I was pastoring at the uh, cathedral, looking after the young adults ministry, there was a young adult who came to me, Pastor, I'm addicted to pornography, what should I do? So among all the other advice I gave him, I said, this is my number, you know my number, call me. I told him, call me, text me. When you feel the urge to view pornography, I'll pray with you, and then you know when to stop or not start at all, and then we see the process. Seek help, seek help from someone. Don't struggle alone and in the dark. And finally, finally, this is a message for all the married couples in our midst. Be faithful to your spouse. Be faithful to your spouse. Remember the vows you took at your wedding. Those are covenantal vows. Be faithful to your spouse, to your husband, to your wife. Don't look or fantasize about another man, about another woman. And be sensitive to the intimacy needs of your spouse. So these are the ways, practical ways, may God help us by His grace, by His mercy. Let me conclude. You know, in church history, spiritual revivals have happened when these three issues have been dealt with. Money, sex, and power. Read up. In church history, most times when these three issues are dealt with decisively and dealt with powerfully, money, sex, and power, spiritual revivals happen. So sometimes we wonder, hey, how come my spiritual life is not moving? Perhaps we might be struggling in one of these three areas. Our struggle with lust offers us clues to the longings in our heart. Two things. One, to be loved intimately by God. And second, to love other people with this love that we experience from God. He is the good, good Father who loves us with an unfailing love. And He has called us to love one another. That is the deep longing in our heart that we need to take care of. And when these two areas are taken care of well, we will be protected and guarded in this area. Finally, just some verses to encourage us and then I will end. Jesus told this to his disciples, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but it is the son who remains forever. If the Son, the Son of God, sets you free, you will be free indeed. Set free. Set free in Jesus. And the Apostle Paul affirmed it in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now, praise God, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free. Set you free. Set you free from the law of sin and death. No condemnation, no condemnation in Jesus when we truly, truly repent. Thank God for the praise team who chose the song so well today. Hallelujah, you have set me free. The Lord has set us free. We need God's mercy and forgiveness. I always like the part of this song, Men of Sorrows, and in 
this song, there is a chorus. They say, now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me whom the Son sets free. He is free indeed. Praise the Lord. We are set free. The curse of sin no longer have a hold on us. We no longer need to remain in the bondage of the seven deadly sins. Greed, envy, anger, sloth, gluttony, lust, and pride. God has set us free. God has set us free. Amen. I just want to give us some time to allow the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts. And even if we particularly may struggle with this area of lust, or even for that matter, the other seven deadly sins that we ask God to create in us a clean heart. So in these few moments of silence, just allow the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts. God is always merciful and gracious. So today, would you cry out to God to have mercy on us, to create in us a clean heart, to renew a right spirit, to restore the joy of His salvation. A broken and contrite heart the Lord will not despise. Loving Father, you alone know the depths of our heart and our struggle in these areas of the seven deadly sins. Greed, anger, envy, pride, sloth, gluttony, lust. And we thank you, God, that when we truly repent, your grace and your mercy is boundless. So, Father, I pray, God, for your people, that any one of us, in particular, struggling with any of these sins, Lord, by your grace, by your power, Lord, we look to you, we cry to you for help to overcome. Thank you, God, that you will receive us. There is now no condemnation for those 
who are in Christ Jesus, and we are set free, set free from the bondage to sin. The Spirit of God, work mightily, powerfully in our hearts today. Thank you, Father. We ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You have any questions? Thank Pastor John for his message. And even as we sing the closing song later, and after, if there is anyone who would like to uh, receive prayer, please feel free and safe enough that in this church, there will be others who will come around you in prayer. Shall we rise? Let's receive God's blessing as we draw this service to a close. Now the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, that God loves us. He knows us who we are fully, but He loves us. So the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, remain with you always. Amen. So may we go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Then I heard a thousand stories of what they think your life, but I heard a thousand whisper of love in the day. Service is over. There will be breakfast at level one and enjoy a fellowship.